Uh, my name is Joe Felsine. I'm a Senior Vice President of Clinician Technology Enablement at Pacific Dental Services. Uh, today, uh, these two leaders are going to talk about the dental space. Uh, Steve Thorne is the founder and CEO of Pacific Dental Services, and Amir Agdai is the CEO of Invista. So welcome, gentlemen. Glad to have you today. Hey, thanks, Joe. Absolutely. Thank so you. I'll give everybody a little bit of context for the conversation and then uh, some of the logistics, and then we'll get started with the conversation. So today, we're going to talk about the, mo the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the dental industry, uh, how these two leaders are navigating their organization through these uncertain times, and then their uh, individual perspective on the future of dentistry. What's the future of dentistry hold for, for these two companies and broadly for the industry as a whole? Uh, so the conversation's gonna be about 30 minutes between the two of them, and at the very end, we'll save some time, about 10 minutes for Q&A. So I just invite you to begin submitting your questions now uh, via the chat function, that would be great. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. So Steve, would you kick us off and talk a little bit about how the, the change in the dental industry has resulted from this pandemic? Wow, it's, um, thanks Joe. And hey, thanks Amir for jumping on uh, today. Really appreciate it. And well, I wanna hear how it's impacted Invista and all your different businesses too, but it has been just the, the toughest, most challenging time in my career, 32 years in dentistry, to lead through this uh, pandemic. It's, it, the way I describe it, it was, a, it was like an elevator ride down where somebody actually cut the cable on the elevator. It happened so fast and how business just went to almost nothing over, overnight. I mean, most, most dental offices were down, I think on, on average, if you look at the industry, it was down about 96% across the industry, an elevator ride down, and now it's an escalator ride up. And what we didn't know as of a couple weeks ago, we didn't know as states began to open what, how long the escalator ride would be, nor the, the, the pace of the escalator ride and how fast it would go up, right? But what we're seeing is, is absolutely astounding to me. It's, uh, we're coming out of this way faster than we ever thought. Uh, demand is way better than we ever thought. Uh, and yet, and I know we'll get into it, yet I think there's some parts of dentistry that are forever changed because of this pandemic. Um, a month ago, dentistry was essentially a bankrupt industry. I mean, it, if you looked at the P&Ls, I don't know, and balance sheets of, of all our companies, all the big companies out there, and the medium-sized companies, and the small practices, uh, we were all essentially insolvent. If you just looked at a straight solvency uh, standpoint. And yet now we're all going, woo, okay, we, we probably all had to take on a little more debt. I know we did. And, um, but now we're getting rocking right out of it. So Amir, I don't know, uh, that's kind of the, the two month story there in a, in a brief, yeah. brief couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks Steve, thanks for the invitation. I really like that uh, metaphor about the elevator and escalator. We, we, given that we have a kind of a broader set of footprint and in different geographies, we saw that happening in China at the end of January. We saw that kind of early indicators come in. As they were coming, we got a little bit more prepared for it. And the way we went about it, look at it kind of at three different factors. One, the number one thing, like you did as well, health and safety of our employees. Immediately we went to this notion that anybody can work from home, we're gonna send them home. Offices, try to make sure that we go through a radical rapid change of overlapping shifts. We, take, we took manufacturing in the distribution center, we went to a different model to make sure that we build inventory that we can be prepared for what is about to come. Uh, next, we started putting a lot of energy around maintaining relationship with our customers through developing a whole set of virtual capabilities. And I, I, I can't tell you, Steve, how amazed I am, how quickly the industry <coughs> went from you have to come and visit me to I understand it, I'm ready for virtual training. Just give you one example. 
Nobel premium brand and implant. We normally do a once a year symposium. We have about 12 or 1300 people attending. Right. We did this virtually. 12,000 people attended that time. Wow. We had one session that 5,500 people logged into it. it was just, they weren't in the dental what? offices. Like I said, they were all closed. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened in here. I think they had a little bit of time. They want to get yeah. up to speed. And then a lot of effort around making sure that we're in a stable situation. We are a five months old company for all practical purposes. December 18 is when we became a fully independent. So we needed to go to work very quickly to make sure that the foundation is solid. But exactly as what you said, we prepared for the worst and we are seeing that a gradual improvement, geography by geography, procedure right. by procedure. And I, I can't tell you how pleased I am to see how quickly this industry is ramping back up and uh, we're ready, we're ready and able to really help this to come back to what it used to be and even in a better pace. Yeah, every, everybody might not know the, the product lines, the companies you invest or runs now. Why don't you go through them? Exactly. I'm happy to do it. We're, give or take, about $3 billion. Uh, we're about 12,000 employees worldwide. And a good way to look at it is a lot of equipment treatment unit, hand pieces, imaging pieces, brands such as uh, Cabo in that category, ICAT, Dexas, Gendex, um, a lot of consumer, day-to-day consumable under the Cybron, Endo, and uh, Curve mm -hmm. brand. Infection prevention, metrics, and a lot of those categories. And then on the implant side, we have a Nobel Implant Direct, and in our uh, Ormco category and ortho, we have the Damon uh, system as well as a new aligner, clear aligner. Half and half, half of it is equipment and consumable, the other half is direct, and it is what we call it a specialty, right. implant and ortho. About 3,000 sales force worldwide, and uh, we really we have been fortunate to be able to kind of build this conglomerate of different product categories that goes hand in hand and uh, consider ourselves to be fortunate to be your partner and help you yeah. to get back on track and start growing again. Yeah, well, hey, thanks. And yeah, you have been a great partner here. And, and for, for us as a, a dental support company, uh, we, we obviously didn't have the, the breadth of businesses that, that you did in the, in, the, in the pandemic that happened in the crisis. And so it, it really devastated most operating companies like us out there. But uh, like you said, we, we as CEOs, I think we had two primary responsibilities. The first was the health and safety and welfare of our people from uh, just keeping people safe. And the second is health, health and safety and welfare, welfare of our people in their financial realm too. Keeping, exactly. keeping the business up and running. And we had to furlough a bunch of people, but we're bringing them, them back um, and starting to, and I think most companies doing the same thing. Um, but it's also changed how dental practices are operating. And, and I want to hear, I'd like to hear what you're seeing in China. But for us, the volume of patients that dentists can see is now down. And I think that's, that's probably going to be uh, there for good because of the new, ch the new chip protocols in PPE and the personal protective right. equipment, right. Right. all the infection controls, how many people we can have in, we're not gonna have packed reception areas, you know, until they come up with a vaccine or something for this. And, and so there are certain parts of dentistry that have been, I think, forever changed. So we're trying to navigate that. There's a certain degree, certain number of staff that are, are nervous to come in and work in the dental office, even though I can, uh, I can say that we've had a, approximately 750,000 unique patient visits in the last two months and we're still not aware of a single documented oh, wow. transmission of the coronavirus within a PDS supported facility. So we're real proud of that. And, and I think dentists have always been great at PPE. This is just now exactly. we're at a whole nother level, huh? Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely correct. Similar to what you said, we have 12,000 employees. We identified six cases in the past three months or so and we have done everything possible to make sure of the health and safety of our people. But, right. you know, the dental offices 
uh, are one of the safest places that you could go to begin with. If you go and get an implant, you're basically going to a sanitized, secure place. But you're absolutely correct. The sanitization, disinfection process is taking a toll, and it's going to be a different process going in. So what we have seen, Steve, is digital dentistry. It's not just a model, but it is really beginning to take shape. Let me give you one example. We handed over 200 licenses to the orthodontist in the United States. We asked him to just test that idea for us. Two weeks ago, I was on the phone with the ortho orthodontist for an hour. He told me that he's now able to see 70 to 80 patients through virtual consultation. Case management, progress improvement, that is not on our situation. That is not going to solve things, but I think it is really allowing to start looking at a different model of managing cases, going for implant in a secure environment, and we've got to adopt to that, how people register for it, how to come to offices. I, as hard as that is, I think this is a pivotal point for this industry to become a lot more effective, to help the safety and get better clinical outcome. We just got to get adjusted to it and figure out what the future is and start moving that direction. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, it, kind of, it brings to mind back in the early 90s. I got started in this in the late 80s. And so I lived through the, one of the worst areas for dentistry back in the HIV crisis, right? I don't know if right. you, were, you were there then too. And back then, dentists didn't wear gloves. They didn't wear right. face shields. They didn't wear eyeglasses. Man, many dentists didn't even still sterilize instruments at that time. Right. Crazy as that may seem. Uh, so we've, dentists have gotten very, very good at personal protective equipment. In the last three decades, we haven't seen massive problems nor even minor problems of infectious diseases, whether it's TB or SARS or all the various um, communicable diseases traveling through dental offices in the country. Dentists are trained as well as anybody to deal with uh, splatter Correct. and blood and all those things. And so I think this crisis has proven out how safe dental offices are. And now we're, we're having to go to a whole nother level of safety to convince um, not only patients, but team members that, hey, this is a safe environment. And, and one other thing I think that we all have got to be just a little bit more patient on is reacting to, um, to kind of pseudoscience out there right now. There, there's a lot of rumors out there of what's real and what's not, and a lot of discussion. And I think it's smart for us to wait for the proven science to come out before we make radical changes. Now, I'm not saying we don't do all the proper PPE for the CDC guidelines and those types of things right now. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there's other things that are, have been discussed that dentistry might have to move to that we should wait for the science to come out on, on this disease and see where it shakes out, huh? Yeah, see, one, one, something is really interesting that has really shaped our innovation product that we put out there, exactly consistent with what you said. We, we had some ideas, we had some uh, uh, roadmap in place already. What we recognize is that we have to accelerate some of them. For example, yeah. we have loops that a lot of your dentists use, and we have really developed face shield right, right in front of it that doesn't interfere with your glasses or your loop. Example of really responding to this. In the implant area, you average the speed of what you needed to do in the past with five or six drills with a 1,000 RPM. The new generation of implant that we are putting out there is 50 RPM. Less noise, less damage, less blood. You know, you can, you can get through that a lot easier. A right. lot of the new product and techniques that you're using, it's going to adjust. New innovation is going to adjust to be able to get to a different model. Again, I... I I have to say this, that this is going to pivot the industry right. to a safer, more productive place. If you embrace it 
and you start kind of adjusting to these new realities about right. how you manage care, how you manage patient, how do you do procedures. Um, we're not look, we're not looking forward to it. We're not happy about any of it. We're trying to manage through it. But I think there is a silver lining in here about the new generation, mm -hmm. the future of this industry. How do you take care of the patient in the best possible format? We're ready for it. We want to be part of this equation going forward. Yeah, I absolutely think that it, this will be catalytic to change and will speed up change. It's definitely speeding up change in our space on the DSO side. Uh, groups are growing out of this much, much quicker than independent uh, docs right now. And we're being flooded with calls. And I know um, all my competitors are too, of dentists are wanting to join groups because we, ha we have access to PPE, we have access to you know, great vendors like you, you guys, and partners in in, in this. Um, you know, one of the things I think we're we we've had to obviously stop a bunch of projects, but one of the projects we we're sure not stopping on is our conversion of the whole organization from what I call 2D to 3D. You know, dentists have worked for years in a in a two dimensional world when it comes to the X rays they're looking at to the images for the most part, and it's just time. And I I. I want to hear what you see around the world, but it's time for the United States to go to, to comb beam and go to CBCTs. We're doing it. It's exciting. It's one of our partnerships with you, with Invista. You guys make a great product there. And so uh, that's, that's, it's going to be catalytic to change because people understand that what's going on in their mouth affects the rest of their body now more exactly. and more. Right? Yep. Exactly. So let me, let me talk about that a little bit. You yeah. know, if you go back, again, you, you, you have been around this a lot longer. You're a founder and influencer of this industry. You go back, you know, buying a CBCT and putting that in office, it was a huge expense. And if you didn't use it uh, effectively, if you didn't see the return on that investment, it was a really extending your capabilities. The prices have come down, what the capabilities have gone yeah. up. You know, the OP3D that you guys are hopefully uh, deploying across the board, it's just half of the price of what it used to be only five, ten years ago, two, three X capabilities that it was two, you know, five years ago. The software is going to play a really important right. role in here. Really Having important. that capability, being able to see so you can make informed decisions. You don't have to have 25 years of experience to figure out, okay, what is right, what's not. Now you have some tools that gives you productivity, give you insight to be able to put the best possible right. planning in place and show your patient what the outcome is going to look like. And then this software integration, reducing unnecessary waste that exists in the system. I am, honestly, I love this industry and I'm amazed how inefficient it is. <laughs> <The number. laughs> and, and I hope I, you, me, and we can make an impact and make it more and more efficient. And what I mean by that, the number of different software that you use, the number of times that you write things, the USBs that you carry from one place to another, different tools that you go in order to solve a very specific problem. I think CBCT imaging at the very beginning is beginning of that transformation. Give you a starting point. If you have a software that integrates this, it gives you planning, try to bring it all together, put a standard process in place that everybody uses it, and then go through the execution in a common right. format. That's the vision that we are after. Be able to see more patients, get better clinical outcome, bring that efficiency to the system, and that investment is going to pay off huge for you guys. Yeah. I just know it. Even without CBCT, I'll give you an example that you're thinking is spot on. Even without CBCT, we've been able to improve what we call percent served, which is basically it's a number we look at to see how much dentistry was diagnosed on a patient versus how much did the patient actually get done over a period of time. Right. Okay. Exactly. So, we look at it as a, as a measurement of health, of oral health. And we've been able to help docs move that through the various systems we have in 2D. In 3D, we think we're going to move that to a whole nother level, not think, we've obviously tested it, 
we know we're going to move that to a whole nother level for to help docs and patients uh, help docs deliver better care to patients because they see so much more in those images and the patients actually I'm not a dentist right and you can look at a 3d image in certain of the software programs right and you can understand what you're looking at most patients don't understand what they're looking at when they look at a 2D x-ray, right? And so right. I think I think comb beam is going to be critical part of the future of dentistry and it's just so many, so many ways. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's really exciting. Yeah, that acceptance rate that you're talking about is gonna make a huge difference. At the end of the day, this is about giving care, giving dental care to a large number of people, make it available, democratize it. And I think you guys are doing an incredible job to bring that to the mass, to the population, make a different impact, make an impact. Uh, yes, we want to be productive and make money, but there is a cause in here. And I think you guys are leading that cause and uh, we're going to do everything possible to make it successful. The rest is we're trying. We are trying really hard. And if you look at, uh, again, back to the crisis that we're we're coming out of right now, and then you look at and you look at the comorbidities of patients that have had serious problems with the coronavirus or even died of the co coronavirus. Most of the co comorbidities dentists can can help with whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart disease, uh, certain forms of cancer, uh, hypertension, and some of those areas that what we see is dental medical integration is, has been happening for a few years. It's real and it's going to speed up. And with companies like yours involved, it's going to speed up even faster. And you know, we're, we're well positioned to, to go after that in a big way. And we're betting the we're betting the PDS kind of farm on on dental medical integration for the future, and um, I know you're seeing it also around the world too, huh? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There are you know there are business reasons, and there is a, a higher cause. There is a strategic. Right. Reason. If we can combine these two together, then you can really see the future. You guys have been seeing it by building some of those capabilities and fundamentals in place, now is the time to start digitizing it, modernizing it, taking it next level, and then offer a whole set of other capabilities. Just to give you one example, we went forward and say this dental office is the safest place to even make it a test site that people yeah. can come in and do that. Yeah. We were looking for various options to be able to do that. You have an environment that is one of the safest environments that anybody can go to. Now imagine, you walk in, if you can offer a set of services, it's a lot broader than drill and, you know, fix. That you can, as you said, look at the total health, total body uh, capabilities. There is yeah. a lot to be done in here. And, uh, I'm, I think I'm it, excited about it. I think in dentistry, I always laugh that of, of all the professionals that give injections, dentists have got to be one of the most highly trained of next to maybe an <laughs> anesthesiologist, right? And giving an injection in the, in the oral cavity, that's hard stuff. Very yeah. hard to do. And yet, I don't think in most states they can even give a flu shot in the arm with a needle this big, you know? It, you're talking about licensure expansion, which is a uh, get me on my soapbox, Amir. I'll, be, I'll go off on that one. <laughs> Um, it's anyway, Hey, I want to thank you for all the, all the work, um, and this has done and you and I have been, uh, partnering for a couple of years now as you lead there. I know we're, we're, um, we were jamming on your Nobel product right before this crisis hit. <laughs> I hope it picks up through the rest of the year and, uh, and the 3d we're super excited to continue to work with you and and continue to uh, grow this industry and get get dentistry back into the main part of healthcare. we could have done such a better job through this crisis i think and you know, i know you're you're in it to win it like i am too over the long haul and provide that leadership the industry so desperately needs yeah i appreciate it steve you, you have been a really great supporter and help and a coach to me. I'm not a dentist, new to the industry, but as you said, we are in it for a long run. We are in it 
to make a difference in here. We look for partners such as yourself, that you have a right cause, right environment, and uh, we're willing to invest and stay with you and make you successful. We're going to do our part. Rest assured, you can count on us. Thanks, Amir. Awesome. Gentlemen, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to break in here. I can't. We have 11 questions, so I doubt whether we're going to get to them all, but you've got a very engaged audience out there. Uh, Steve, I'm going to start with um, one here. It's about uh, new grads and the opportunities. Are there opportunities for new graduates to work in PDS-supported practices? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. We, we love new graduates. Uh, I'll say it again. We love new graduates that want to get out and help patients be healthier and happier. Uh, so... We have, an we have incredible training programs. They may be pushed back a little bit right now because of this, uh, this, this crisis we just went through. But rest assured, uh, we're bringing people back as fast as we can right now. So if you're one of those docs that's looking for a, a great organization to be with, get the training education, have mentors around you all the time, partnered with great, the, the best, um, the best manufacturers and suppliers out there like Invista. Yeah, we absolutely have a place for you. And I think it's a great, great long-term fit for so many dentists. That's great. Another question, maybe both of you can weigh in on this one. It's a really good one. We hear it a lot. How can dental practices recoup PPE costs when insurance is barely covering it? Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, so I, I can speak from experience of what happened with the increased PPE from the HIV crisis back in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, most dentists, uh, I believe at the time, I think we did too, I was, I was working for my father at the time, who's a dentist, uh, charged an uh, extra fee. I think back then it might have been $5, but I think a lot of dentists right now are charging $10, $15, $20 for the PPE. But I, I think ultimately that gets worked back into the way the CDT code system works and we'll get back worked into the CDT code system. Kind of feels awkward to tell a patient they got to pay extra for safety. You know, that just doesn't fit right. So I think that's why it gets worked out in the, um, in the near term. It's not going to happen overnight, but maybe by the end of, 2021 or so, we'll see the carriers get on board. And some carriers have already stepped up and already started reimbursing uh, dentists for that. I want to acknowledge all of you that have done that. Uh, thank you. It, it is needed by all the dentists, for sure. So the carriers out there, a uh, big uh, shout out and gratitude to all of you that have stepped up and reimbursed uh, the dentist for the PPE charges. I think the ADA has recommended that. And all the carriers that have not stepped up and done that. I want to encourage you to step up. They are real costs and it is very expensive and they're your members that we're, um, our supported clinicians are protecting out there. Here's a related question. Um, Brian Wood asked it, how can payers help with the new dental normal? <laughs> well, that, I just sort of answered that one. You can help right there, right off the start. But we'll, we'll see. You know what's interesting is, is dental, kind of dental plans, dental insurance. I don't, I don't really call them insurance because they're really dental plans. And dental plans haven't changed much in my 30 years. And I'm not blaming the plans for by any stretch. It, there's a, a culture in the in the United States that has kept dentistry and dentists separate from the rest of the body and the health of the rest of the body. And I think that's really hurt. In some ways it's helped dentists and dentistry, but in some ways it's really hurt dentists and dentistry. And I think in that reimbursement area it has because the studies are clear. Patients come in, let's say a diabetic patient, they come in for regular, their regular periodontal care it's going to reduce their overall healthcare costs. And dentists should be reimbursed for that in a fair way. And, and they're often not. So I don't know, Mary, you have any thoughts on that from around the world? Yeah, we, we've seen, and 
in in some Nordic countries, um, you know, it is just kind of a government make this investment by age 12, 13, 14. You get that auto treatment early on in order to not have additional costs coming later on. So, you know, a lot of that has to do with the culture, with the society that you're in. In some other places, the extreme cases, there is none, everything out of pocket. There is. So I, I think this is it's going to evolve over time. We all have a role to play. We're beginning to think about, you know, how do we create additional productivity? How do we create simple product that, you know, sanitizes a disinfected environment that doesn't require as much time and energy going through it? So we have a role to play. I think the insurance company will have a role to play. But I think this is going to evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, just the same thing that I said before. I think this environment is going to accelerate some of that, yeah. some of those changes. And um, uh, one more thing, Steve, the larger the players are, the bigger you are, the consolidation that takes place, the more influence you have. As much as we like individual operators, but when you come together, when you have forums of the top two, three manufacturers, the top two, three, four um, support the organization, come together, we will have an opportunity to influence decision. We will have a bigger right. voice as we go forward. I think that yeah. is going to be a factor in here. Yeah, so thanks for teeing that up real quick, Joe. So I think you're right, and there's a few of us, you guys included, that we're starting a, some new kind of a public service announcement campaigns. We did the dental ER, and that went really good across, across the nation, and I think it even went internationally. And we're starting two new ones. One's called uh, the Dental Heroes. Dental Heroes to acknowledge all the dentists that stayed at work and served served uh, right. America through this crisis. I know we we had uh, in in the sixty day forty five day crisis. Sorry, in forty five days of the crisis, our supported docs had forty one thousand new patient emergency exams. Forty one thousand emergencies come in. It's absolutely astonishing, and I'm sure lots of other groups did too. So Dental Heroes, and then we're also starting a new dental safety, hashtag dental safety campaign too. Just to tell the American public that going to the dentist is necessary and safe. Right, right. That's great. So these are two questions that are very closely related. One is, how do manufacturers view the role of a DSO? And the other question is, uh, how many how how many small dental practices will survive in the future? So there's very oh, related. Take this one off. Let me see if I can I can take the DSO piece. Uh, yeah. We see them as a positive thing. We really see them as a positive thing because of the professional view that they bring into the market, the skill that they have, ability to really see three, five, ten years down the road because it allows us as a manufacturer to get a line and start developing product and capabilities that really look at that type of horizon. Steve knows that, and I'm not saying anything I haven't told him. We are willing to partner and invest, not because we want to see the result right away, we want to see the result in the long run. When you have organizations such as PDS in there that has that kind of view, it gives us the confidence and a support that we need that we can tap into it and extend it. You, you, you wonder, okay, how is that financially going to help you? It does, because you lay the infrastructure, and then what are you going to do? You're going to start offering more and more services. The more services you offer, the more opportunity for us to participate. The more implant you do, the more endo cases that you do, the more ortho cases that you do, it gives us an opportunity to be part of that process. We want you to build the infrastructure so that opens the gate and then add to it going forward. Uh, I'll pass it on to you on on individual uh, practitioners. Yeah, that's great. And and yeah, to just tag on to that. Yeah, when uh, when Amir and I are talking about large purchases, let's just say it's dental chairs or it's implants or it's endo equipment or whatever, you know, we're, we're talking in years, years, many years we're never talking in just the next month or what we're buying uh, right. this week so just to give a frame of reference 
Um, I remember I, I was at a meeting once and I had a de dentist, independent dentist say, you mean to tell me you get your supplies cheaper than I do? And I've been at this because he'd been at it for 20 or 30 years. I go, uh, no, I can guarantee you I get my stuff a lot cheaper than, than you do as an independent because we buy on behalf of, you know, thousands of dentists. So uh, that's how, how that works. And we work together and we, it works great. So with the independents, I think um, Marco at the ADA has even said too that he sees this crisis as, as uh, going to be really hard on independents. And we've heard it too. I've seen it out there. A lot of independents still aren't open for business, whereas most of the larger groups are. And we'll see how the consolidation uh, happens. But my, my bet is that this will uh, speed up the consolidation. Lar DSOs make up roughly 25% of the, of the groups in America today. Uh, I think there were some estimates in the next few years that that could rise to as high as 40% in as fast as a few years. And I think that's probably pretty accurate. Awesome. Well, we've come to our time limit, but everybody in the audience is super engaged. So maybe each of you could take a minute or a minute and a half and just, you know, benefit the audience with what you think about the future. What does the future of dentistry hold for Invista? What does the future of dentistry hold, uh, you know, for, for the PDS supported practices and that sort of thing? I think they'd really- Let you go first, Amir. I'll close it out. Yeah. Thank you. We, we set the company in, with a very um, purposeful mission. That mission is to help you, to help the practitioners to improve people's lives. That is not just a logo. That's not something that it is just sitting on my back on, on the PowerPoint. It's something that we truly believe. For us to make that real, what we need to do, we need to have relationship with the best and brightest, with the companies that are making a difference, they have to have products that it is the best in the market. And we really need to create a different model of this uh, transformation over time. Our purpose, the way we look at it, 65% of people in the United States, they have access to dental care. We like to see that acceptance rate to go up. We like to see more people come into offices. We like to be able to really make that available. We see our role to help you to become a lot more efficient to make that happen. You step out of the United States, you go to some of the Latin America, other places, less than 10% of people have access to basic dental care. We see that as an opportunity and obligation for us to be able to make a difference in this industry. We believe in it and we think that we have the capabilities, we have the capital structure, we have the innovation engine, to be able to make a difference in here. Doing good for the right reason is gonna benefit all of us and that's what we see in here. That's the role we're gonna be playing. We're excited about it. We're excited about the future mm -hmm. and we think that purpose that we have all time has merit to it and it's gonna long last. And we are building a heritage in here. I wanna make sure that that is stand the test of time. See? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're spot on. We are. I think even before this COVID crisis hit, we were entering the, what I call the golden age of dentistry. Things were just beginning to change to going all digital, whether you look at the growth in implants, the growth in 3D, you look at the growth in so many different areas of dentistry, plastics, like you mentioned, the clear aligners and all that. It's an exciting time to be in dentistry, but it's changing. And I, but I am absolutely convinced that the next 10, 15, 20 years are gonna be some of the best dentistry has ever experienced. Because what we see is that patients understand the mouth-body connection. Patients get that what's going on in their mouth affects the rest of their body. And they are more likely to take care of their mouth than they, than they would have even a decade ago. And that's super exciting for us. You, you said your purpose, our purpose is healthier, happier patients. So we support great clinicians. We build great infrastructure, great technologies, implement proven technologies and, and all in supporting clinicians to create healthier, happier patients. And we think that's a, a, a 
big, big mission for us to go after to help people uh, live healthier lives and happier lives. So we're, we're totally committed to that too. We're excited about that and excited about the industry. Yeah, it's a little tough right now. Uh, I don't want to ever go through that again. It's like the, the cat that got on the, on the stovetop. It's like, no, you don't want to experience that again. But, um, but it, it, we're going to come out of it uh, better and stronger for sure. So thanks, Joe. Absolutely. Thanks to both of you. I know the audience thoroughly enjoyed the, the dialogue, the question and answer. The engagement is really high. People are still on, which is awesome. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, thank you, the audience, for attending. Uh, continue to look for more opportunities like this coming your way. Steve will be hosting others uh, to talk about dentistry, what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we found that the audience really finds a lot of value in it. So with that, We'll sign off and uh, say thanks once again. Thanks, Amir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Joe. Bye.